Hello students. In this video, we will be covering chapter eight of your textbook, which is the topic of functions. And let us just begin with the definition of a function. And this is pulled from your book, but it is, I mean, this is standard across all textbooks. You'll see basically the same thing. Um, a function is a relationship where each input corresponds to exactly one output. And in one sense, this sounds straightforward, but um, in practice, I see uh, a lot of places where students get tripped up. So I'm going to go through some examples so that we can get an idea of what we really mean. Um, let's yeah, start. So yeah, we're going to look at some examples and try to determine, is this a function? Is this not a function? So here's our first one. Let's consider the relationship that takes as input a parent and gives as output the names of each child that parent has. So I'll have you pause and think about this for a moment. Turns out this relationship is not a function. And that's because each input, which is a parent, uh, potentially corresponds to multiple outputs, the names of all their children. So it doesn't mean that every input has to correspond to multiple outputs. So in my case, if you put in me as an input, you would get out the name Phoebe, and that's it, because I only have one child. Uh, if you put in my mom, you would get the output Sarah David Robin, and because she had three children. So uh, you don't need every input to correspond to multiple outputs to fail to be a function. You just need one input to correspond to multiple outputs and your relationship will no longer be a function. Now let's look at a uh, similar relationship uh, and see what we think. Now let's consider the relationship that takes as input a parent and gives as output the number of children that parent has. Let you pause for a second and think about this one. In this case, this is a function. And that's because each input, which is, again, the inputs are, is a parent, uh, corresponds to exactly one output. That output is a number. And so you put in me, you get out the number one. You put in my mom, you get out the number three. Put in my brother, you get out the number three again. And so each input, you get one output that's corresponding to that me one, my mom three, my brother three. Uh, notice that it's okay for two different inputs to correspond to the same output. So it happens to be the case my brother has three children also. So, and you know, obviously lots of people uh, in this world would have three children. So there are lots of inputs for this relationship that would spit out the same number for an output, but that's okay. It's still a function because every individual input that you have corresponds to exactly one output, a number. So I feel like if you can get clear on why the first of these is not a function and the second one is, then you're golden. Um, okay, so let's look at some mathier examples. How about the relationship that takes as input a number x and gives as output the number two times x? This is a function because each input, if you give some number x, it corresponds to exactly one number, the number 2x. Then, um, yeah, multiplying by 2 gives you a unique number out. Now, how about this? The relationship that takes as input a number x and gives as output both the positive and negative square roots of x. Here, this is not a function because now you have two outputs associated to each input. For some number x, you get the numbers square root of x and minus square root of x. Okay, all right, so much for the definition of a function. Why do we care about functions? Uh, I remember no one ever telling me this when I was learning about functions, so, uh, but I think it's, you know, 
we should tell our students why we care. Um, here's an answer that's not satisfying. They're easier to deal with. <laughs> I mean, that's just, it's true. That's why we have them, uh, or that's one reason why we care about functions. The math is easier with functions. If you only have one output for each input, it's just easier to deal with. Your graphs pass the vertical line test, and you don't have to worry about uh, keeping track of, um, yeah, multiple outputs for one input. So, okay, the unsatisfying answer is that it's easier, and that's, we just, you have to start somewhere. Um, I think a more satisfying answer uh, is that functions are the main type of relationships that we study in science. Um, we, you know, in, in science, we study how one variable relates to another variable. And, uh, and, you know, we'll look at some examples. And it's often the case that you're running an experiment and you, your, your input is, um, I don't know, the per, you input some parameter into your experiment and then you get an output of your experiment. And you really want to focus on, you want to like isolate one parameter in your experiment and you want to isolate one output and you want to see how they relate. So really functions are a like the main type of relationship that we do study in science. Um, hopefully that's a little more satisfying. Um, so like, let's look at an example from astronomy. I love astronomy. Uh, I'm wearing my NASA sweatshirt that I got from Target. Okay. So, um, say an astronomer wants to understand how the position of Venus in the sky depends on the time of year that you look. Okay. So this seems like it's a function where your input is the day of the year in the output is then going to be how far above the horizon Venus is at sunset. Um, or this is one function that you could look at as an astronomer to try to understand this relationship. Um, so now let's suppose that astronomer's assistant gave her a data set that had as input the day of the year and as output gave both the position of Venus in the sky at sunset and also the position of the sun in the sky at 10 a.m. on that day. Okay, but that relationship that the assistant gave is not a function, and that extra information about the position of the sun is not helpful for studying how the position of Venus depends on the time of the year. Um, okay, so hopefully that motivates a little bit why we bother with functions. So there are four main ways to represent a function. Uh, one is in words, so we've seen that before, but let's continue with um, an example. Uh, so, all right, the relationship that takes as input the day of the year and as output gives the height of Venus at sunset on that day. That's a, that's a, a function. We can see a function written as a formula. Could be something kind of complicated like this, like, h of t equals absolute value minus t minus 125 squared plus 40, um, which happens to be a decent uh, formula representing the function um, that I just, uh, uh, that the, the Venus example, um, this happens to be a decent approximating formula. But okay, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so yeah, we have in uh, we can represent a really a function in words. We can represent it as a formula. We can represent it in a table. So here you might have in your table the day of the year, and your observations of the altitude of Venus at sunset uh, at sunset in degrees above the horizon. So. Yeah, like maybe you're looking at January 1st and Venus is about 32 degrees above the horizon. February 1st is 24 degrees. March 1st, it's 19 degrees. So these are all measurements you could make of your function and then you can uh, uh, organize those into a, a table. And then the last way to represent a function is through a graph. 
Uh, and this happens to be the graph of the altitude at Venus, altitude of Venus at sunset uh, at different times of the year. Like I said, I like astronomy. I was given some feedback in the past that maybe this is like too esoteric for Math 110, but um, I love astronomy. Maybe some of you do too. And uh, yeah, I think this is cool. This is like, you know, some astronomers really created this graph and this table uh, of this function. Anyway, okay, enough of the esoteric stuff. Let's talk more nuts and bolts about what we'll see in this class. Function notation. This is nobody's favorite. So the simple f of x means, oh, this, it bumps me out because this symbol has confused so many students and will continue to confuse students maybe for the rest of time. That symbol means the output of the function f associated to the input x. So we are x here, we've named our input variable and f we're calling our output variable. And then we're writing f parentheses x to just remind us that our output variable f is depending on the input variable x. And so this f of x is just the output for whatever your input x is, f of x is the output. It does not mean f times x. And this is a huge source of confusion because it looks like f times x. And I'm, I'm with you. I remember being confused about this when I first was introduced to function notation and being pretty dang grumpy about it. Um, yeah, this is just like a new notation that you are kind of going to have to just memorize and get comfortable with because we're going to see it a lot. Um, and I know you've seen it before in school, but um, just in my experience, a good chunk of students are just still not happy with it. Um, yeah. So you got to get it, get really comfortable with the idea that f of x is not f times x. It just means it's the output if the input was x. Let's do an example. Um, so in Seattle, uh, the taxis typically charge a pickup fee of $2.60 and then charge an additional $2.70 for every mile that they drive. And now you can write the price P of a taxi ride in dollars after M miles by this function. And we write output P of M. So the output, if the input is M miles, so the price after M miles is equal to 2.6 plus 2.7 M. This 2.6 is your flat fee that you're charged even if you don't um, do anything. And then your $2.70 for each mile afterwards is represented here. So, okay, you have this function. You might be asked to do something like evaluate P parentheses one. What does that mean? Well, P of one is the output if the input is one. So it's the price if you're driving one mile. And so to calculate that, plug in one for the miles. So P of one is just 2.6 plus 2.7 times one, which is 5.3. Something maybe equally important is to be able to do something like interpret this um, like result above, like to interpret it in a sentence. So what does it mean that P of one equals 5.3? Well, this is just means that the price of a one mile taxi ride is $5 and 30 cents. And so it's a nice skill to be able to go back and forth between some reading some equation like this or some identity, something mathy and function notation and recognizing what it's saying and be able to put it in a sentence. Okay, 
So we've got the same examples before. This is the Seattle uh, taxis in Seattle example. Now let's make a table of values of this function. Well, okay, start, you've got your two columns. Your left column is your inputs. Uh, our inputs are M and the right column is going to be the output associated to each input. And so I'm telling you what values to use for the input here, and I'm pretty sure in all the examples we'll do in this class, I'll just, if I'm telling you make a table of, a table of values, I'm going to tell you what values to use for your input. And then it's a matter of calculating the outputs for each of these inputs. So if your input is zero, your P of zero is 2.6 plus 2.7 times zero, which is just 2.6. P of one, we already calculated that, that was 5.3. And here in this row, P of two, you plug in two for miles and you get eight. P of three, you get 10.7 and P of four, you get 13.4. Okay. So if you have an equation, you can make a table of values by plugging in a bunch of inputs and then organizing your uh, data in that table. You can also be asked to graph this function. And um, sure, you can like use a graphing calculator, but if you didn't have one, um, the way you might graph this function is to say, all right, well, I have my table of values from before or if you didn't have a table of values, you make one and you plot the points. This is a place to start, just plot the points. So here, if M is zero, P of M is 2.6. So our X axis is actually our M axis here. So if M is zero, our output P is 2.6 or something around here. In this row, we have the point one, 5.3. One up 5.3, something like that. In two, eight. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Three, ten point seven. Three, ten point seven. And four, thirteen point four. Something like that. So, okay, we've got all of these points now from our table. Uh, we've got them plotted. And then the last step is to just draw a line smoothly connecting those points. Here, the, this happens, this function happens to be a line, but if they were, I don't know, seemed like they were bending down, then you would just draw, um, you connect the dots with like a curved line that smoothly connected them. All right. So let's review what I actually expect you to know about functions. I expect you to be able to tell whether a relationship is a function and be able to say why. And if you're saying why, your explanation should some should either be something like, this is a function because every output has exactly one input associated to it. And it's not a function because, or it's not a function because here is an input that has multiple outputs associated to it. So you should be able to tell whether something's a function and give an explanation along those lines that really refers back to the definition. You should be able to evaluate a function and by that I mean like use the formula. Some, so like that example, evaluate P of one. You should be able to do that. You should be able to interpret function notation so for example, when we had P of one equals 5.3, we interpreted that to mean the price of a taxi ride, a, of a one mile taxi ride is $5 and 30 cents. That's something that you should be able to do. And you should be able to create a table of values if I give you a formula and you should be able to plug in some inputs, get some outputs and organize it in a table. And then finally, you should know how to plot points and graph a function. And that is it. Thank you for watching.